Come on, can we put our hands together this morning? Amen, amen. Hey, have a seat on the way down. Tell somebody, man, you look sharp. You look so good. You look amazing. Look so pretty. Even if, if, even if it ain't true, just say it anyways. <laughs> Prophesy. Tell them it's good to see them. But uh, man, it's so good to see everybody in church. Come on, we got power. Praise the Lord. Come on, who was here last week? Wave at me if you were here last week. Come on, we had church. It was darker than this. Some of you are like, it's dark. No, last week it was way darker, okay? We didn't have no power, but we jumped into the word anyways, man. But I'm so excited you're here. Let me just kind of echo what you're in the middle of right now. Um, This past fall, me and my wife stepped out and planted local church. We're actually still in the process of planting local church. And we set sail full speed with local youth ministry, local young adults, local, all these things, small groups for all ages on January 21st. And I want to encourage you to be here at these services every Sunday until January 21st. We absolutely love Savannah. I'm from Savannah, born and raised in this place. So I love Savannah more than anything. And I would like for you to partner with what we're doing. But hey, before we go any further, can we thank the worship team? Come on, it is so good. It is so good. Y'all, it is December 24th. What in the world? I've been warning the parents every week, it's time to shop. Fam, I'm sorry, it's too late, okay? Everything's closed, but uh, it's absolutely insane how time has flown. Can y'all believe grand opening is four weeks away? Absolutely insane. It's gonna be so much fun. I can't wait at all. You doing well? You look good. I'm glad you're in church, but I wanna preach a little message on this Christmas Eve morning, and I've just simply titled it, From and For. From and For. And I'm going to pray one more time and ask God to do what only God could do. Lord, we love you. Help. Amen. Amen. So, um, short and to the point, okay? I'm the guy you want over at Christmas dinner, okay? So here we go. Um, just by show of hands, I know I do this a lot, but who here, and I got to take a survey, and no, I'm not going to make fun of you, okay? But just by show of hands, wave at me if your favorite holiday is Christmas. Come on, where are you at? Real, oh, most of the room. Okay, yeah, yeah. Your favorite holiday is Christmas. Okay, wave at me if like Christmas is up there, but it's not quite your favorite, okay? You got some other ones, maybe Easter, Thanksgiving, your pastor's birthday, right? Okay, so um, yeah, for me, like, I gotta be honest with y'all. Christmas is up there, but it might come in like two or three. And, and let me tell you why. Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, I'm with it, y'all. I love it. I'm all about it. But can I just be real? Everything around Christmas other than Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, I'm not here for it. Like, I'm just being real with you. It, it's, uh, how can I just say it? It's messy. Like, if you've been on I-16, 204, or 95 this holiday season, you have gone backwards in your walk with Jesus. Amen? You have. You have. Some of you, you had to drive it to get here. You was cussing on the way here. I'm so glad you're in church. I had, it's messy, it's messy. I had someone, no joke, I had someone send me a Christmas card. And by the way, I'm gonna get you back. You know who you are, I'm gonna get you back. Somebody asked me, like, are you threatening people? It's in a threat, sweetheart, it's a promise, okay? But they sent me a Christmas card that had glitter on it. <laughs> Y'all, there's glitter on my kitchen floor. I sent my girls to school the other week. They had glitter in their hair. There's glitter on our pet. There is glitter everywhere in my house. Hey, tonight, maybe some of you are gonna gather in living rooms and you're gonna unwrap presents and all that stuff. And can we just be real, that living room when you're done, it's messy. Some of you, I'm not trying to point names or point out anybody, but some of you who have 14 trees in your house, Letha, okay? <laughs> January 2nd rolls around, guess what? It's messy when all them trees got to go back in that attic, right? It's messy. Christmas is a messy, messy season. And I love the church in America, and I love what we stand for, but can I be honest with you guys about something that kind of grinds my gears a little bit? Um, Christmas is messy, but the church, it took us 2,000 years, but we cleaned up Christmas. We cleaned it up. I was talking to some pastor friends this week. We were joking around. I don't like this word, but I'll say it right here. It's just fitting. Um, I wonder if Christmas was triggering for Mary, right? Like life's good. You got an amazing husband. Then the angel tells you you're pregnant. You're a virgin that's pregnant. Could you imagine? Okay, Mary, I'm sure, I'm sure that's how that went down, right? You packed for a week because you're going to Bethlehem for a census. Turns out you're gone for four years living in Egypt. Herod's killing babies. I just... I just have to say, we've cleaned up Christmas. 
It took us 2,000 years, but we cleaned up Christmas and we narrowed it down to a clean nativity scene that we put under our Christmas tree with clean wise men and clean manger. Even the hay is clean, right? We've cleaned this thing up to silent night holding a candlestick. Can I be real with y'all this morning? Christmas is messy. And I'm gonna preach, I'm just, I'm gonna preach a sermon this morning that's messy. I'm gonna preach a thought this morning that's a little bit different from what you're used to hearing on Christmas Eve. But I promise you, we're gonna get to the Christmas story, but it's gonna take me just a little bit of time. And let me kind of give you a side note real quick. Um, the more of a church background you come from, uh, the more disturbed you're gonna be during the sermon, okay? Um, just, just a forewarning, okay? Uh, so you gotta stay with me, stay with me. We're gonna get to the Christmas story, but stay with me. It's kind of like... Um, who here, you've ever baked a cake before? Wave at me, you've baked a cake. I've never baked a cake before, to be honest with you, but I know some people who have. And um, I mean, you know, a cake don't make a whole lot of sense on its own, right, with the ingredients. You got eggs and flour. This sermon's gonna be kind of like that. It ain't gonna make a whole lot of sense until we get to the very end, but I need you to stay with me. And if you invited a friend this morning, um, don't apologize in the middle of the sermon. Because in the middle of the sermon, you're gonna be like, oh, I'm so sorry, okay? But just stay with me, and it's gonna be an amazing time. And here's my goal this morning. My goal this morning is that you would look at Christmas in a way you've never seen it before. And I believe through this sermon, you're gonna see some things you've never seen before. So I wanna talk about four characters before the Christmas story. They tie into the Christmas story, but four characters, and then we'll set sail. Write down the first character's name right here. I wanna talk to you about a woman named Tamar. Tamar, everybody say Tamar. Tamar is in the Bible, she's in the book of Genesis. Uh, many of you, even if you have a church background, chances are you don't know much about Tamar. Tamar isn't really taught on, right? Tamar, uh, you didn't learn about Tamar in Sunday school, okay? You did not learn about Tamar in kids' church. And don't stress, local parents, your kids are not learning about Tam Tamar this morning at the Christmas Eve experience next door, okay? I promise you they're not. But um, like this, this, there's not much you can pull out of this story that's very positive, like, like this, this is, uh, you didn't learn about it. It's not a good coloring sheet to write when you're in kids' church and your parents pick you up. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And this is one of those texts, I'm just reading the Bible, people. Okay, I'm just reading the Bible. This is for these people. You know those Christians that are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And they're like, I love all the Bible. You, you wanna stand by that, okay? All right, here we go. Nobody's running to the store to get this story printed on a t-shirt. Okay, nobody's getting these Bible verses on a Pinterest coffee cup, okay? You ready for the word? Oh, I don't think you are, but here we go. Genesis 38, verse six, the story of Tamar. In the course of time, Judah arranged for his firstborn son, Ur. Time out. Um, Judah's 0 for 1 on baby names at this point, okay? <laughs> Could you imagine? Judah, you're having a son. What do you want to name him? Let me think. Ur, perfect. We'll write that down, Okay. <laughs> to be married to a young woman, Tamar. Everybody say Tamar. So we got Ur marrying Tamar. Okay, verse seven. But Ur was a wicked man in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Amen, let's pray and go home. Okay, so interesting, right? Then Judah said to Ur's brother, Onan, time out, 0 for 2. Okay, 0 for 2. Judah, you're having another son. What do you want to name him? Oh man, we got it, Onan, okay, Onan. Go and marry Tamar, as the law requires that a brother of a man who's died, you must produce an heir for your brother. So in this culture, don't miss this, if your brother died, you would now go marry your former sister-in-law. Weird, right? Weird, right? You would not marry inside the family, okay? Just think Kentucky, okay? Um, so this is insane right here. Let's keep reading, verse nine. But I'm just reading the Bible, people, just reading the Bible. But Onan was not willing to have a child who would not be his own heir. So whenever he had intercourse with his brother's wife, he spilled the semen on the ground. This prevented her from having a child, follow the science, prevented her from having a child who would belong to his brother. Wow. But the Lord considered it evil for Onan to do this. So the Lord took his life too. The Lord's like Oprah right here. You get to die, you get to die. I mean, all of these sons are dying right here. Let's keep reading, gets a little crazy. Verse 11. Then Judah said to Tamar, girl, Go back to your parents' house. Remain a widow until my son, Sheila, over oh, three. Sheila is old enough. What is that? Is that the Lord? Is he coming? Is that the trumpet? Okay. Y'all are stupid, okay? I was just making sure I heard it, okay? I was going. I was just, I was going. Are we good, tech team? 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Come on, can we thank the tech team? Put our hands together for the tech team. I thought we were going, church. Say, praise the Lord. Here we go. <laughs> I'll start over because I lost my train of thought. <laughs> then Judah said to Tamar, I said, thunder is coming. Okay. Judah said to Tamar, his daughter, go by to your parents' house, girl. Wait till my son, Sheila, 0 for 3, is old enough to marry you. Judah didn't really want this to happen because both of his sons died. So Tamar goes back to live at her parents' house. Like, like he had no intentions of Sheila marrying Tamar because he's going to die too. He's got two dead sons and one common denominator, Tamar. So Tamar goes back to live with her parents, alone, confused, desperate. How could my life get here? My life is in shambles. It wasn't supposed to be this way. You ever been there before? Yeah. Like, how did I get here? Yeah. Like, I, I always, I just wanted to be married one time. I didn't want the, the papers to slide across the table. I didn't want to have to fight with my spouse every time I got home from work. I didn't want to get the daughter's report that they were sick. They were never supposed to die. We've been there. And we sit back alone, confused, abandoned. How did I get here? I wrote it like this in my notes, write this down. When my life, when I felt alone, forgotten and abandoned, I got desperate. And here's what I've learned. Against popular belief, desperate people don't make great decisions. Desperate people don't make great decisions. So Tamar gets desperate. Oh, you know what I'll do? He sent me to live with my parents after both of his sons would not give me a child. You know what I'll do? I'm gonna get him back. I'm gonna get him back. If I ever get a chance to get my old ex-father-in-law, Judah, I'm gonna get him back. Fast forward a little bit. Judah, right, his wife, Tamar's former mother-in-law passes and they're trying to cheer up Judah because his wife died. They're like, hey man, uh, let's go down to Timnah. They're shearing sheep. It'd be, let's go to Vegas. Let's have a good time, man. Let's just kind of take the load off a little bit, relax a little bit, have some fun with the boys. And he's like, all right, yeah, that sounds good, man. I'll do that. That sounds good. And Tamar gets word that her ex-father-in-law, whom she hates and is mad at, is now on the road traveling to Timnah. And the Bible goes on to, to say that Tamar's like, ooh, I'm going to get him back. This is going to be crazy good. This is going to be good. You know what I'll do? I'll dress up like a prostitute, and I'll wait on the side of the road. And when I see Judah coming, I'm going to walk up and say, will you sleep with me? So that's what she does. The Bible says Judah walks up, and she says, she, she presents herself. And the Bible says Judah does not recognize her. This is his former daughter-in-law. And the Bible says that Judah has sex with her. This is insane right here. This is crazy right here. And she says, well, what are you going to pay me? And Judah says, uh, I'll give you a goat. I don't know if that was like the going rate back then or what. I'm not really sure. But anyways, it was a joke. Um, I'll give you a goat. And he's like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll give you a goat. But she's like, well, you got to send it to me. And how in the world am I going to know that you're going to send me the goat? Give me something I can hold on to. Give me something I can keep until you get back from Tim to get back so I can get this. So watch this right here. Genesis 38, verse 18. Watch this. What kind of guarantee do you want? He replied. She answered, leave me your identification seal and its cord. And by the way, even that walking stick you got. So Judah gave them to her and he had intercourse with her. She became pregnant. Their father-in-law, former father-in-law. Now we read that and we're like, identification seal, it's coordinates walking. That doesn't mean anything to me. Today, that would be like, Give me your driver's license and your social security card. Listen, ain't no woman that hot, okay? Because if I lose my driver's license and my social security card, you're telling me I have to now go to the DMV and deal with the government? I'm out, okay? I'd rather just die on the side of the road, okay? So we're not doing this right here. And then the Bible says that she gets pregnant. Houston, we have a problem. Father's Day just got really confusing. Hey, buddy, check it out. This is your dad and your granddad, right? This is Uncle Daddy, okay? Like, this is crazy right here. This is absolutely insane right here. So word gets back to Judah. Judah has no idea this is Tamar. Word gets back to Judah. Can you believe Tamar, your former daughter-in-law? I know she was supposed to marry Sheila in a little bit when he got older. Can you believe she, she dressed up like a prostitute and she got pregnant by some man? He, he, he thinks nobody knows what he did. He's like, can you believe, what was she doing? You know what? Have her burned at the stake. Burn her alive. And they go to get Tamar and they're dragging her out and I can see her. And she's like, hold up. I got baby daddy's ID. Hold up. I got it right here. And watch what the Bible says right here in this next verse. Watch this. But as they were taking her out to kill her, 
She sent this message to her father-in-law. The man who owns these things made me pregnant. Look who this is. Look in really quick detail of who this is. And the Bible says that Judah goes, oh my goodness, you are more righteous than me. To be honest, Judah, you didn't set the bar very high, okay? But you are more righteous than me. This is a crazy story. She's in a terrible, terrible situation. Desperate, lonely, forgotten, abandoned. Let me read you the story of the birth. I'm a, once you see this, you can't unsee it. So stay with me right here. Pay attention to some names. When the time came for Tamar to give birth, it was discovered that she was carrying twins. Ladies, how would you like that? You're about to give birth. You're like, all right, we're done. The doctor's like, nope, round two, sis. Okay, here we go. While she was in labor, one of the babies came out reached his hand, the midwife grabbed it, tied a scarlet string around it and said, this child came out first, let's keep reading. But then the baby pulled his hand back in and out came his brother. The midwife exclaimed, how did you break out first? Don't miss this, it was named Perez and the other baby with the scarlet string was named Zara. So we have Tamar, abandoned, confused, ashamed, regretful. Let's just leave that there. Let's talk about another character in the Bible, way less controversial. You ready for it? Let's talk about Rahab. Let's talk about Rahab. Rahab, let me give you some backstory. Israelites are wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They're wandering, they're going to the promised land. The first city they encounter is the place town, right, is Jericho. Jericho, if you grew up in Sunday school, remember this is the one they marched around all the times and they shouted and the walls came down? They're in Jericho right here. They come up to it and it's absolutely crazy. And I'm about to mess with some church people. I'm just gonna let you know. I'm about to come in your living room, sit down, put my feet up on the coffee table, okay? I'm about to mess with you a little bit right here because what I'm about to read you is bothersome if you grew up in church because you ain't never seen this before. Don't miss this. Watch this. Joshua chapter two, verse one. Then Joshua secretly told the two spies from the Israelite camp at Casey Grove. He instructed them, hey guys, here's what we're gonna do. Scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. Clear instructions? Clear instructions, right? Check your head, yes. Some of you looking at me partly cloudy, okay? Um, clear instructions right here. Go scout it out. It's gonna be awesome. Go take a look at it. It's gonna be great. Clear instructions. Watch this. You ain't never seen this. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute. <laughs> um, I know in church we've spiritualized this because Rahab like hid them and stuff after the fact. Please don't miss this. Like they showed up to a prostitute's house on their own. Joshua did not instruct them to go there. They showed up on their own. And I'm trying to be reverent right here. Andrew, be reverent. It's Christmas Eve. This is good. But we've sanitized the Bible. I was talking to some of our teaching team this week, and they read this, and I was reading it with them, and I just asked them, I said, we don't know if they partook. We don't know. These were good men. These were men of God. And they showed up at a prostitute's house. Um, I'm trying to be reverent. Stay with me. Um, I don't know any way to say this. Uh, they didn't have a Bible study that night. You understand, right? They showed up on their own, willingly, to a prostitute's house. These men of God going to do this. Now let's talk about Rahab. Why was Rahab a prostitute? I've been in youth ministry. I've been in young adult ministry. I've helped people make decisions on what they want to do with their life. I've never had a conversation where someone said, I know what I want to do when I get older. I want to be a prostitute. Yeah. I want to sell my body. I want to be used. I want to be an object. I want to be a commodity for people. How did Rahab's life end up in this prostitution? Well, chances are in her past, maybe she was sexually abused. Maybe in her past, she was sexually like, promiscuous. She, she, she was hopeless. She was desperate. Don't miss this. She was trapped in a lifestyle that she thought she could never get out of. There's people in this room this morning, you are trapped in a lifestyle that you don't think you can get out of. And it's not prostitution, but it's pills. And it's not prostitution, but it's addiction. It's not prostitution, but it's that thing that you know you shouldn't be doing. It's transferring money to accounts that you know you shouldn't transfer. And it's that relationship you gotta get out of and you've tried, but you're stuck in a life that you can't seem to break free of. So the king of Jericho, he finds out, there's two spies in Rahab, the prostitute's house, so the king shows up, the army, we're here to get those spies. And the Bible says that Rahab hides the two spies. Let's be real, probably not the first time she's hid men in her home, right? She hides the spies. The spies come down after they leave, like, 
thank you so much. I promise you, Rahab, we can keep this between us, okay? Um, whenever we come in and we take this place over, we will spare you, your house, and anyone in your house, okay? We're not, we're not gonna do it. We're not gonna mess you guys up too, too bad. And watch this right here. Watch this. Joshua 6, verse 17. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute. Okay, we could have left her occupation out, right? We could have left her title out, right? Isn't it interesting that sometimes in church culture, if we're not careful, we'll know people by their sin and not by their name? Isn't it interesting that there was a day where Christians knew people by their sin and not by their name? Man, I'm glad we've come so far. This is absolutely crazy right here. The story continues right here. Well, here's just the truth. I'll say this. There's people in this room. When you walk into certain rooms, you feel like people don't know you by your name. You feel like people know you by what you did. In a season when you were damaged. In a season where you were maybe a little bit destroyed. In a season where if you could go back, you would do it different. In a season that you're ashamed of. In a season you don't want to talk about. Watch this right here. The label continues. Joshua chapter 6. Meanwhile, Joshua said to the two spies, keep your promise. You can almost sense Joshua's annoyance. I didn't tell y'all to go there. Keep your promise. Go to the prostitute's house. Now she don't even have a name. She's just the prostitute's house. She doesn't even have a title. Listen to me. It's pre-launch. I can say what I want to say. We will not be a church. Local church will not be a church that knows people by their sin. We will be a church that knows people by their name. And the truth is, there's people in this room, you have allowed other people to know you by your sin. I'll take it a step further. You have allowed yourself to refer to yourself and think about yourself as your sin. Well, I'm an addict. I'll always be an addict. Well, I've been divorced three times. That's just who I am. It kind of comes with the territory. I come with baggage. Let's keep moving. Let's talk about Ruth. Ruth. Ruth is a couple chapters after Joshua. It's a quick read. Only four quick chapters. And let me give you a little insight on Ruth. Ruth talks about a couple that lived in Israel. They lived in Israel, but they had to escape Israel because of a famine. And they escape Israel to go to a place called Moab. Everybody say Moab. They go to Moab. And God warns us over and over, don't go to Moab. Moab's a bad place. You don't need to be there. It ain't good for you. You know how Moab got its start? Genesis 18 and 19, story of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? The Bible says that a dad had sex with his daughter. They had a child. They named it Moab. This place is bad. Moab is known for sexually immoral people. They had false gods. Studies would show in Moab when their crops weren't growing, they would cast a baby into the fire to false gods. This place is bad news, but these couple with their two sons pack up and move into Moab at this it's normal. I'm just going to live a life here. This is going to be great. We're going to put roots down here. Our sons are going to grow up in school here. Everything's going to be fine here. There's so many sermons in this, but we're going to be okay here. And the Bible says they grow up, and the two sons, they marry Moab women. Then the Bible continues, the two sons die. And now the mom, Naomi, is stuck with a daughter-in-law that was married to her son that's now dead. I'll read it to you. Watch this right here. Ruth chapter 1, verse 22. Watch this, watch this. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the young Moabite woman. There we go again with the labels. Ruth, the young Moabite woman. Why, why can't she just be Ruth? Why have they got to talk about where she's been and what she did and the people she was connected to? Why can't she just be Ruth? Watch this. The labels continue. Ruth chapter 2, verse 2. Watch this. One day, Ruth, the Moab, again. This is absolutely insane. They keep referring to her as this. There are people in our city, church, don't miss this. There are people in Savannah, Georgia, all over our city this morning, on a morning like Christmas Eve, and they will not step foot into a church because they know if they step foot into a church, people are not gonna know them by their name. They're gonna know them by their sin. Oh, that's the guy that, that's that former business owner that, that's that wife that, that's the parents of that child that, and they won't step foot into church. That's the couple that, that's the mom, and they won't step foot into church based off what people are going to say. And watch this, it gets worse for Ruth. One day there's this guy named Boaz, and Boaz is like, who's that girl over there? He's a looking and he's a liking. He's like, who is that girl? She is fine. Okay, watch this right here. Next verse, watch this. Then Boaz asks his foreman, hey, who's that girl over there? Who does she belong to? And the foreman replied, she's the young woman from Moab. 
She doesn't even get a name. The label continues again. And let me pause because some of you are like, this is the Christmas sermon? Yes, we're going to get to the Christmas story in just a second. I told you it's like a cake. And some of you are like, well, this cake is gross, okay? But just stay with me, okay? It's going to be good. But I got one more uncomfortable story to talk about first. So we got, we got Tamar, got Rahab, got Ruth. Many of us are familiar with King David, right? The guy who slayed Goliath. He's also famous for something else. Write this lady's name, name down. Uh, let's talk about Bathsheba. Let's talk about Bathsheba. Bathsheba is, um, she's named appropriately, and you'll see why in a second. Let me read it to you. Watch this. All the church people. Church people give yourself away when you laugh at that stupid joke, okay? Watch this. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab, an Israelite army, to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army. They laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Keep reading. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, y'all, don't we wish we had a midday rest? Could y'all imagine? 2 p.m., clocking out, midday rest. Be back in a few, right? All the moms are like, amen for a midday rest. Okay. He's got his midday, late afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed, he said bed, walked out to the roof of the palace. He's out on the balcony looking over. He noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. David, 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 you dirty dog. Question, and don't be too church. Stay with me right here. Don't get too weird, okay? Some of you get weird right here. Um, can we all agree? Oh, this is gonna be weird. Can we all agree in most cases a woman knows how to get a man's attention? Answer the question. Yes, all the women are shaking their head. All the husbands are scared to answer. They're like, uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Sir, shut up. You look every time. Shut up, Okay. So we, we can all agree, right? I grew up in church. I grew up in church, and this story is always pinned on David. And don't get me wrong, David is a knucklehead right here. It takes two to tango. This is bad news. David is being an absolute idiot right here, but scholars would tell us it was typically normal, because some of y'all wondered, why is the girl on the, on the rooftop bathing? Super normal in this day. They actually didn't have hot water, so the sun, it was normal to take a midday bath, right? The sun would shine down, it would heat up the water. But also studies would show us very modest society. They would drape like drapery across the top. They would put tents over the bath. So if anybody was looking, you, would be, you could have some privacy right there. Can we just be real? Bath, Bathsheba knew she was in the king's sight from the king's balcony. She knew all the men were at war. She knew her husband was out of town. She knew what she was doing. So this wasn't just like sweet little old Bathsheba just taking a bath, just not, not. No, she knew what she was doing. Oh, there's the king, right? Like she knew what she was doing. I won't even do that again, okay? She knew what she was doing. She knew exactly what she was doing. Watch this right here. This is crazy right here. Second Samuel chapter 11, verses three, watch. He sent someone to find out, hey, who's that girl taking a, taking a shower on the roof? That's Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent his messengers to get her. Hey, get that girl. Bring her over here. And he slept with her, and she had just completed the purification rites of having her menstrual period. Thank you for that unneeded information. Then she returned home. Let's keep reading. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Houston, we have a problem. I slept with this girl. She wasn't. She wasn't. Her name's Bathsheba. Today we'd call her Shower Sheba. She was not my wife. I was not supposed to be with her. And all of a sudden she's pregnant. You know what I'll do? I'll cover it up. You ever done that before? I'll cover it up. I'll delete it. I'll put the money back into that account and I'll trace it back over here. It'll, I'll shred it. It'll be okay. I'll cover it up. Let me give you a recap of how he tries to cover it up. He says, you know what? Bring Uriah home. Bring him home. Have him sleep with Bathsheba, his wife. And that way, right, it looks like they had a child. Then we'll send him back. Uriah, he won't do it. He get, they get him drunk. He still won't do it. Finally, David's like, he won't sleep with Bathsheba. What am I going to do? This woman's pregnant. I don't know what to do. This is going to be so bad. Ah, oh, man, we got to have Uriah murdered. David, a man after God's own heart, murdered the husband of Bathsheba, because he got her pregnant. Bathsheba, her story goes on. She becomes one of David's many wives. Sad story. The child that she's pregnant with right here, she loses. 
Then they have another child. Some of you are like, where is this going? I'm glad you asked. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, what a list. You know what's inside this right here? Sin. Sin. Can we all agree all of them sinned? Rahab sinned, for sure, right? Rahab, Tamar, 100% Bathsheba, we get that one, right? There's sin, right? But the next thing right here, look at this. There's also sorrow. There's sorrow in that box. If I could do it different, I would. If I could go back, I wouldn't have done that. Here's what I know. There's sorrow in that box and there's sorrow in this box. There's people here that if you could go back, you would never do what you did. Look at the last one right here. Let me just chase a rabbit for a moment. There's shame. There's shame. I truly believe, and I make no bones about it, the church in America is in the state it's in today because shame is running rampant inside the church. Shame is running wild inside the church. Here, you can write this down. Shame creates a Pharisee spirit. I've learned shamed people, shame people. I've learned, wait, why we gotta talk about me? Well, can we talk about you? You ever heard church people? Church people, can you believe they are doing that? Can you believe they would do that? If I, they could act more like me, they'd be a little more saved, right? Ain't it funny you can smell everybody else's breath is bad, but your nose is right over your mouth and you can't smell your own breath? That's church people. Why we gotta talk about me? Let's talk about everybody else. I'll never forget. I was about nine years old and um, I had the biggest fear in the world. I had the fear of going over to stay the night at somebody's house and a big spend night party with all the guys. And I had a fear. I never really did this. I don't know why I was so scared of it, but I had a fear that I was gonna wet the bed. So I can remember, you can laugh. I can remember, some of you had this fear too. I can remember if I was going over to a friend's house, it was like, I'm using the bathroom 10 times before I get in bed. I'm stopping all liquids at 6 p.m. Like I have a protocol to this, okay? You better catch me wetting the bed, okay? Um, but I'll never forget, the next morning at one of these spend the night parties, I woke up and one of our guys, one of our friends had wet the bed. And you know what I did? Instead of covering him, I jumped in, oh! Jimmy wet the bed. He's over there like, no, it's Fanta. Bro, Fanta don't smell like that, okay? That ain't Fanta. You wet the bed. I pray we are never a church that points at other people's sin and won't shine light into our own lives or our shortcomings. Because that's the church. Shame people. Oh, I got some. Some things you might be dealing with shame if. You ready for them? You might be dealing with shame if you pray in tongues, but you gossip in English. Call it what it is. Here, let's keep going. You, you, you might be a Pharisee if you shout at church. Praise the Lord. I've seen it my whole life. You shout at church, but nobody at your work's ever been invited to your church. You might be a Pharisee if, oh, you fervently worship and you praise the Lord and you're shouting and declaring the blood over your husband and the blood over your wife, and then you get home and fight with your husband and nag your husband. You might be a, can we just be honest? and say, yeah, there's shame in this box, but there's shame in this box for sure. Now, to the Christmas story. <laughs> Y'all know, Matthew 1, we all know it, Matthew 1, verse 18, the, the virgin and all that stuff. We picked this up in Matthew 1, verse 18. And I thought that was where the Christmas story began. Y'all, I missed it my whole life until this year. The Christmas story does not begin in Matthew 1, 18. The Christmas story begins in Matthew 1, 1 with the genealogy of Jesus, the lineage of Jesus. You ready for it? I want you to stay with me. I'm gonna read you the bloodline of Jesus. Stay with me right here. You ready? Check this out. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, descendant of David and one of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Keep going. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. <laughs> Hold on. You're here to tell me Tamar is related to Jesus? Like, like you know, you, he just mentioned Tamar in the, in the genealogy of Jesus? Like, you know there was women before her and after her. Why in the world, would, why is the writer, why is Matthew saying Tamar? It's simple. You can write this down if you're taking notes. No Tamar, no Jesus. Jesus worked through her life. And I don't know your situation here this morning, but if your life is a mess, I'm here to tell you our God makes miracles out of messes. Tamar. Let's keep going. I, I got to read a little bit more. This is going to get good here in a second. Watch this. Matthew 1, verse 18. 
verse four. Ram was the father of that guy, and that guy was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was, was Rahab, right? Whose mother, this, this is getting crazy right here. This is getting a little bit nuts right here. You're Rahab, Rahab the prostitute. No, that was the Old Testament. This is just Rahab. She was a prostitute. Don't miss this. This is the genealogy of Christ. And don't miss this. In Christ, you are known by your name. Without Christ, you are known by your sin. How is Rahab in the genealogy, in the bloodline of Jesus? Let's just keep reading. Watch this right here. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. My, it's got to be a coincidence. How is Ruth in there? Ruth the Moabite? No, just Ruth. Don't miss this. Write the time for taking notes. In Christ, the label doesn't stick. I'll keep going. The quickest way to lose sight of who God says you are is to worry about what everybody else says you are. The quickest way to lose sight of what God says about your life and God says about your marriage and God says about your relationship is to care about what everybody else thinks about. The label gets dropped. Let's just keep going. Matthew 1 verse 6. Watch this. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow. What is going on right here? You mean Bathsheba on the rooftop, the one with terrible intentions, the one that was up there, hey. Like, you're telling me Bathsheba? How in the world are they in the bloodline and the genealogy of Jesus? Don't miss this. Only four women are mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, and it's them four. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, out of all the women they could have chose, why did he choose them? It's proof. You can write this down. Could it be that the same people that Jesus came from, Jesus came for? Amen. Could it be that the same people he came from are the same people that he came for? In this box, we see forgiveness. We see forgiveness. We see restoration. It's a miracle that this is even recorded in literature because oftentimes women weren't recorded in literature at all. Why did he choose them for? It's simple, to understand that in Christ you are completely forgiven. You're forgiven. You ain't gotta live like that anymore. Isn't it crazy? We'll pray and ask God for something and for two weeks we'll wonder, God, you hear me, right? Lord, you heard me, right? Then we'll say a cuss word and we'll apologize 10 times in one day because we're certain he heard it. He for sure heard it. I know he heard it. It's almost like we think God focuses all on the bad and if I've done anything stupid, he's never gonna use me. That makes sense until you crack open your Bible and you understand that everybody God used is flawed, broken, messed up, abandoned, just like me and just like you. And they're not Bible heroes because of how great they are. They are Bible heroes because of how great he is. Forgiveness. Let's get hot for a second. Honest, open, and transparent. We're a hot church. Um, some of you don't have that big of a problem forgiving others. Like you understand this point that you're forgiven. You're like, yeah, I'm forgiven, therefore I guess I can forgive others. And who do I need to forgive today, Andrew? My dad? Yeah, he wasn't there like he should have been. I should probably forgive him. My mom? Yeah, probably should forgive her. The coworker? The ex-husband? I should probably forgive as well. But you, you don't have a problem forgiving anybody. But here's the truth. Some of you can't forgive you. You can't forgive you. You think Tamar had to walk through some self-forgiveness? You better believe it. You can't forgive yourself. Some of you, the person you need to forgive is the person who was there, the person who sent the text, the person who wired the money, the person who lied through their teeth over and over. You need to forgive yourself. This is crazy right here. In this box, there's also freedom. There's freedom. Write this down if you're taking notes. Many Christians in this room can't walk in freedom because they are reminded. I'll never forget, I was 16 years old and I got my first truck. I was so excited about it. I was so pumped up about it. And I was pulling into this, uh, this girl's driveway to take her out on a date. And she's in the truck, I'm in the truck, and I'm backing out of the driveway. And I don't know what happened. Somebody must have moved her family's mailbox because it was right in the middle of the driveway. <laughs> Um, I took care of it, um, and I nailed this mailbox. It was embarrassing, but more than that, I was upset. I had a huge dent on my tailgate. I'm thinking, what in the world? I could be having the best day ever, but I walk out and see my truck, and I get sick to my stomach. 
Some of you, it's just like that. Every time you see them post, you're sick to your stomach. Every time you're reminded of how happy they are that now you're not in their life, you're sick to your stomach. Every time you're reminded of that season, you're sick to your stomach. Every time you walk in that place, you are sick to your stomach. And I wanna remind somebody, your identity is not found in the dents on your life. Your identity is found in the forgiveness on that cross. You ain't gotta live like that anymore. You can walk freedom, walk in freedom. Do you think in heaven right now, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba are walking around on the streets of gold with their heads down? No. You know why? They're walking in freedom. I know it makes no sense right now, but that thing that you are dealing with this morning, that thing that is keeping you up at night, I promise you, God is going to use it for his good. Walk in freedom. In this box, there's also celebration. There's celebration, why? Because you're forgiven. That thing, whatever it is for you, it was paid for on the cross. You're forgiven. And I love the story of baby Jesus in the manger and Jesus on the cross and Jesus in the tomb. You do realize he is in none of those three places. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. You can walk in celebration. You can walk out of here different and don't miss this. Without that mess, we don't get Jesus. Without that mess, we don't get the miracle. Without those horrific, uncomfortable stories, we don't get the birth of Jesus Christ. So there's people in this room, you just need to come to grips with Jesus as your king. But like, I don't know what it was like 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, but something I love is that he had the shepherds there. The dirtiest people ever he had at his birth. The dirty, these people weren't allowed in the temple to make sacrifices, but Jesus, our Lord goes, yeah, 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 I want them. Those are my people. I need my people here. Can we stand to our feet this morning? Heads bowed, eyes closed all across this place. Nobody looking around. Just for a moment, we're gonna pray, we're gonna sing. Nobody looking around. But maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Andrew, I got some areas in my life Man, they're a mess. Marriage, finances, relationships. I, it is an absolute mess. And I'm walking around in sorrow. And I'm walking around in shame. But there's an area. If you're telling me that God can work through that mess, I just got to believe this morning that He can work through my mess. I love the Lord. I'm a Christian. But there's areas in my life that are at a complete mess. If that's you, would you shoot your hand up? I got areas in my life that's a mess. Hands up all over this place. If that's you, there's areas in my life. They are a mess, man. Hands up all over. If that's you, heads bowed, eyes closed. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Put them down. Nobody looking around on this last one. Maybe you're here and you'd say, I had never had that thought that the people he came from is the people that he came for. I'm one of those people he came for. And I don't yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And on Christmas Eve, I want to start a relationship with my new Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ is my King. You're here and you don't have a relationship, but today that changes and you want to give your heart to Jesus, head bowed, eyes closed. Would you just shoot that hand up? I want to give my life to Jesus this morning. Hands are up. Put it up high. Don't be ashamed. Hands are up. Come on, if that's you, put it up. Put it up. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for doing what only you can do. Thank you for meeting us here at local church. Thank you for everything you've done in this place, Lord, for the people who are saying, my life's a mess, things are crazy. Lord, I'm giving it to you. If you can work through them, you can work through me. For the people that said, Lord, today's the day I start a relationship with Jesus, thank you. December 24th, 2023, we draw a line in the sand and we choose to live a life for Jesus your name. Amen. My life was a mess, but Jesus, the light of the world. I was addicted, but Jesus, the light of the world. My finances were in a, but Jesus, the light of the world. 
I was messed up, I was broke, I was busted, I was disgusted, but Jesus, the light of the world. Yeah. I didn't have a relationship with God, but Jesus, the light of the world. I didn't know if I was ever gonna talk to him again, but Jesus, the light of the world. If you have your candle with you, can you just twist it to the on position? I know Jenkins Athletic Club appreciates our choice and candles this morning on their basketball floor. But that's your story. Jesus, the light of the world. We prayed about what song that we want to sing here at the end, and we're going to sing the blessing. And this isn't a song that we just sing to sing. This is a prayer. This is a blessing that you're going to sing over your life. If you're standing next to friends, it's a great time to put your arm around them. Husbands, it's a great time to pull your wife in close. Pray for your kids that are over at Kids Church. Call them by name. But we're going to end singing one more song. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for what you're doing in this church, Lord. Lord, thank you for stories like Tamar, and Rahab, and Ruth, and Bathsheba. To show us, if you can do it through them, you can do it through me, Jesus. Lord, thank you for the people who surrender their life. Lord, thank you for the families that are represented here, the friendships that are represented here. Right now, we pray the blessing over everybody in this place. Jesus, the light of the world. Let's worship.